regulatory craft. But one of the things he challenged us as public sector leaders to think about was how do we spend the balance of our time? So do we spend the balance of our time stopping bad things from happening or making good things happen? And when you get into decisions around budgets, when you get into decisions around policies, I do worry that sometimes out of sheer necessity, the balance of where I spend my time, uh, and I'll not speak for everybody else, is very much tipped towards the how do I stop bad things? from happening when really the more fulfilling way of, of working would be um, how could I make more good things happen and that just takes me to, my, to the final point I was going to make which is whether in fact the discussion we're having is about budgets or whether in fact it's actually about good policy making genuinely looking at the impact of ge on gender of the policy design the policy implementation process and the policy evaluation process so is it budgeting I could suggest that actually what we're really talking about is, is good policy making, um, looking truly at what it is we're trying to achieve and at trying to understand the impact of what we're trying to achieve on, on different parts of, of our community and society. So I'm certainly expecting this morning to cause me some soul searching. Um, I'm okay with that. I think challenge is good, challenge is necessary. And I'm also actually really looking forward to the presentations and the discussion and the debate. Uh, so thanks again for having me and let's go and, and see where this takes us. Thanks very much, Katrina. That, that's a great start. So without further delay, I'm just going to pass over now to Professor Joan Ballantyne to start the presentation. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, uh, Katrina. We're delighted, Katrina, that you were able to join us being one of the f a few permanent secretaries who is female. Um, I think what struck me uh, just, Katrina, before I move on is a couple of things you said. First of all, the need to pause and to do some soul searching. And I guess that's what part of the this gender budgeting research project is aimed to do. Uh, I also was struck by what you said about how can we make good things happen. And I think that's uh, some of the things that we talk about in the, in the research that is about making good things happen. And also, I, I totally agree with you, Katrina, it is really about good policy making because that's really where it all starts. But having and doing good gender analysis um, at that policy stage because once the policy is in place it's really a bit too late to actually start to go back and change things. Okay so um, for those of you who don't uh, know I just share the, the slides here. For those of you who don't, don't know Anne-Marie referred to the uh, project that we're currently involved in. It's funded by Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust and we're delighted that they've funded this project. Uh, you can see here the members of the research team. It's a collaboration between universities and civil society. In terms of university, we have got expertise in accounting, finance and economics, social policy and economic justice. In terms of the civil society. Uh, we have the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group who are actively involved. Uh, that's Lynn Carvel, who's here today. She's the chair of the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group and also Alex Brennan, who's the coordinator. Just to note that Ali, or Lynn Carvel and Angelo Hagen are both commissioners on the Commission on a Gender Equal Economy, that is a project that is being carried out by the Women's Budget Group. We're also delighted uh, that uh, Dr. Angelo Hagen is part of the project. Angela, uh, not only being a commissioner, she's a very busy lady. She's also a trustee on the Scottish Women's Budget Group. She's actually also a trustee on the UK Women's Budget Group. She's also the chair on the Scottish Government's Equality and Budgets Advisory Group. And she also, in her spare time, she jointly coordinates the European Gender Budgeting Network. So I don't know where she gets the energy from, but we're absolutely delighted uh, that we have this interdisciplinary and team. And we have a wealth of experience uh, from both academia and from also civil society and uh, the ability to impact uh, and make an impact. 
So this is really the running order. So thank you, Katrina, for giving your introduction. We're going to look at really two things here this morning, as uh, Anne-Marie has already indicated. We're going to look at why gender budgeting in Northern Ireland. Why do we need gender budgeting? Why do we think it's a good idea? And then we're going to illustrate uh, some of the issues that we're going to raise in the discussion today with respect to a case study around apprenticeships in Northern Ireland. And I guess partly the reason we chose apprenticeships is because there's there's probably quite a lot of data out there on apprenticeships so it, it it's easier when you've got some data to analyze so we're going to kind of keep it the discussion a kind of fresh and we're going to mix and match so uh, it, 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 it'll be myself Angela and Michelle will be chipping in as at different parts of the conversation so why do we need gender budgeting in Northern Ireland? Um, so for those of you who know, the, the Good Friday Agreement was signed in April 1998. And unfortunately, that's 20 years, more than 20 years ago. But unfortunately, statistics continually confirm the persistence of deeply embedded gendered inequalities. And these inequalities continue to inhibit women's life opportunities. So even after more than 20 years, we still have a lot of inequalities within the region. And there, there's been lots of research, both academic and governmental, which indicates what these uh, inequalities are. Just to give you a few examples, for women constitute 79% of those in part-time employment and a third of working age women are economically inactive. And there's also a, a persistent gender pay gap within the region. So those are just two examples. There are many other examples and we're not going to rehearse them here. Now, gender equality is significantly important uh, to Northern Ireland, given that there has been a vast amount of research that has been conducted. And that research indicates that countries with greater levels of gender equality are associated with both lower levels of human rights violations and secondly, better outcomes for peace and reconciliation. So those of you who know anything about Northern Ireland will know that we are a society, we're still emerging from political conflict. So gender equality is absolutely crucial uh, to progressing uh, that uh, path that we're currently on. So the next question you might want to ask is, well, why gender budgeting? Why not something different? And I think that the why gender budgeting question is neatly summed up by one of the quotations from one of our interviewees that we, we conducted 45 interviews uh, in the first Joseph Roundtree project. And this is a quotation from one of those. And in this uh, quotation, the uh, interviewee makes a compelling argument for gender budgeting in that she states that women are not just one section of seven of the 75 group grouping now for those of you who don't know section 75 of the northern ireland act 1998 is our legal and administrative equality architecture and there are nine groups referred to in section 75 one of which is gender so what this person says this person says that women are not just sorry, women are not just one of those section 75 groups, they're actually 50% of the population. So therefore, if you improve outcomes for women, then you're improving outcomes for migrants, uh, disabled women, etc. And if you're focused on getting it right for women, then you'd be a good, uh, good way along the road of getting it right for these other women. So this quote goes directly to the intersectionality issue. Uh, and, and I think this is a really good quote to argue why gender budgeting. So what is gender budgeting? So for those of you who are already familiar with it, this will all be fairly familiar. But for those of you who aren't, there are a number of different definitions. And we're picking here on the OECD definition, where it talks about gender budgeting as the application of gender mainstreaming in the budgetary process. So gender budgeting is about persuading policymakers. And I think that's an interesting word there, persuading policymakers. That includes government, parliament, civil servants. Those are some of the key stakeholders involved here. To think about the impact that spending or expenditure and revenue, if that's applicable, decisions have on gender equality. But not just that, 
but also to adopt practices that will bring about gender equality. And I think uh, maybe Katrina, that's coming down to what you've just said about making good things happen. Now, Angela O'Hagan, who's going to speak now in a moment, Angela, however, argues that we need to be very careful because the central proposition of gender budgeting is that budgets in themselves are actually products of established gender norms within government processes and practices. And as a result of those processes and practices, which are already in place and embedded, that will in itself result in gender blind policy and resource decisions being taken. And in turn, those decisions will themselves contribute to the persistent social and economic disadvantage that women face. So what I want to do now, I want to hand over to Angela and I want Angela to talk about uh, gender budgeting elsewhere, drawing on her extensive experience of uh, creating impact in a number of other re regions. And then Michelle's going to talk about, well, the so what, how does this link into uh, Northern Ireland? Okay, thank you very much, Joan, and thank you, uh, Anne-Marie um, and Joan, for the invitation today. And um, it's, it's been really uh, eye-opening and uh, a huge learning um, to be part of, of this really excellent project. Um, I fear I've been talked up quite a bit, so hey, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, just to have a very quick look, in gender budgeting has been, in and, uh, you know, been around as an idea for more than 30 years. Um, it's gained traction in different places at different times. In 2016, um, a study led by Janet Stotsky for the IMF reckoned that in more than 80 countries around the world, there had been different approaches attempted to introduce gender budgeting. Some at the national level, some at subnational level, um, some at, as part of state building in emerging nations, some reforms as part of constitutional reforms such as Austria and Iceland. So use the realisation by governments that the advancement of gender equality is a legitimate political goal um, has supported some of this you know, integration of gender analysis in, in public finance, uh, budget setting, revenue raising and so on. Ronnie Downs and colleagues in their study for the OECD reckoned that again about half of the members were actively considering or had planned the introduction of gender budgeting tools. I think the challenge is to get to that kind of stickiness where, where those tools and those commitments um, stick, you know, they, they are sustained and lead to the kind of transformative change of which gender budget analysis is capable. But what we have seen is that gender budgeting has made a significant contribution to addressing gender inequalities, identifying you know, understanding in the first instance there are unequal outcomes as a consequence of policy and spending decisions and to seek to eliminate them as well as fulfilling a democratic um, aspiration of gender budgeting which is about making budgeting more transparent and increasing women's uh, participation um, in civic and political life through budget scrutiny budget accountability so so building that, that uh, civil society capacity has been a feature of many of the developments internationally and is absolutely what's happening currently as uh, the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group grows in strength alongside the Scottish Women's Budget Group, Sisters in Wales and, uh, and England through the UK Women's Budget Group. Um, and what we've seen is that devolution has taken um, different forms, obviously, structurally, but in terms of gender budgeting, um, there's been a different um, staging, if you like, um, of the gender budgeting um, across the devolved countries. And um, I would say Scotland maybe started earliest and, and Wales and, and Northern Ireland um, are, are uh, coming on board now. Um, and the, what the project has found is that, that there is a bit of a lag in terms of Northern Ireland uh, institutionally coming on board with this idea of gender budgeting. Next slide, please, Joe. So we're learning as we go. We're learning from a range of experience around the world. Uh, colleagues in the autonomous government of Andalusia in Spain with a budget of around 30 billion um, euros, big landmass, lots of challenges, 
looked at those challenges in terms of um, the gendered inequalities socially, economically, politically in their region in 2003 and began a process which resulted in some of the first gender budgeting activities happening from 2005. By 2007, they had introduced the G Plus programme, which was about supporting policymakers to identify what they called the motors for change, the drivers for change. And this methodology was about identifying what budget programmes, what should be funded that would have the greatest impact for improving and advancing gender equality based on um, the, gen the, the data that was being you know, generated to identify persistent inequalities and how they could be overcome. That project has, has continued, it has legal underpinning um, in the finance legislation, there's an annual gender impact report um, alongside the budget and um, there's been a series of audits introduced, so going back revisiting outcomes, all based on the success of the G Plus programme which has produced the, the index, the Andalusian Index of Gender Inequality which is showing that as a consequence of this, this transformative approach to policy making, they're seeing some, some positive results in terms of bringing down gender inequalities. In Scotland, we've been trying to do this for a very long time since the inception of, of the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Women's Budget Group was formed in, two, in 2000, 1999-2000, so a long time ago. Um, some of the recent developments have been um, some work that myself and other colleagues from the Y Centre were involved in with the Economic Policy Directorate and um, trying to improve and support the development of equality impact assessment within policy making. We've had an equality budget statement since 2009, which is now called the Equality in Fairer Scotland budget statement to reflect the introduction of the Fairer Scotland socio-economic duty. And we're still very much involved in that as a work in progress, trying to improve the analytical processes, the understanding of, of the persistent inequalities that there are, and to bring them you foreground them in policy thinking and therefore policy decisions and ensuring that those policy decisions are then reflected in spending commitments and further linked to the national performance framework. So that's ongoing work that we're doing through the Equality Budgets Advisory Group um, with a mix of external and internal members um, trying to build the competence through a trialling a range of tools to support the policy making process. Next slide please John. Wales has been very active uh, on this issue in the last couple of years, including um, part of, of a, a wider rapid review of gender equality commissioned by the First Minister and conducted by Hwara Teg. And that found, perhaps unsurprisingly, and this could apply to any of our jurisdictions, a significant disconnect between existing policy and budgetary processes. Um, ministers commissioned the Wales Centre for Public Policy to provide an independent uh, evidence review looking internationally um, at what practices were going on um, elsewhere that they could bring to bear in the Welsh context of, of tackling inequality through gender budgeting and that study that, that I led with colleagues at the Wales, the Wales Centre and elsewhere is available on their website. And in the Republic of Ireland, again, I mean, knowledge transfer, I think, is a really important part of gender budgeting. Mm -hmm. And there has been a lot of, you know, in, in exchange between the devolved administrations as well as with the Republic. And so, um, and civil society had a lot to do with the push in the Republic of Ireland to secure a commitment in the Programme for Partnership Government in 2016 to develop the process of budget and policy proofing as a means of advancing equality, reducing poverty and and strengthening economic and social rights. So big ambitions there. Um, and there has been some activity to build capacity within government for gender budgeting, trying to indicate that the institutional arrangements, which are absolutely key, are in place to support equality and gender proofing in the independent fiscal and budget office and within key government departments. And the National Strategy for Women and Girls had a similar commitment to undertake measures to build capacity within the civil and public service with regard to gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting. So these are established commitments. And um, the question is to what extent um, are they being, being implemented? Um, am I doing the next slide, slide 10, Joan, or am I back yeah. to you? No, Me just too. you. Yeah. Okay, so 
what we're seeing in these developments is that um, what I would say are the favourable conditions for gender budgeting. Um, you, what you need to have in place um, or you need to create if gender budgeting is going to stick is, is an understanding of gender, gendered inequality alongside the political and institutional commitment to address it. And that means ministers and senior civil servants uh, and all civil servants, but senior civil servants like Katrina are signed up to and sending that message across the institution that this is what is required and expected in the process of, of policy analysis, policy formulation. And that requires the institutional architecture around it, you know, strategies, um, data and administrative architecture. So legislation, dedicated departments, dedicated resource. And in, uh, in Northern Ireland, Section 75 provides some of that structure um, because of the, the, the requirements, the due regard requirement on equality obligations. Um, but there's, there's a way to go in terms of um, ensuring that there's sufficient gender disaggregated data to help identify um, entrenched inequalities and how they might best be addressed. Obviously, key enablers are political will that is sustained, is visible, is vocal, and sustained leadership. High level commitment from governments and across public institutions, because let's not forget that public government budgets, not only are the principal expression of a government's priorities, but they are also dispersed throughout the public sector. And we need to see public sector engagement at the highest level in this agenda. Building capacity of civil servants. Um, who we're asking to do things differently. We're asking to do things, you know, think about policy formulation in a different way, starting with, um, you know, having equalities and human rights as the starting point for uh, thinking about, about policy. And the world over, the engagement um, of finance departments and building that technical capacity with civil servants has been key, as is the engagement with civil society in that model of, you know, government, academics, and, and activists, obviously there's a lot of overlap there. Um, but that exchange of information and those push-pull factors that make for better policy making, which of course has to be underpinned and informed by robust gender disaggregated data. So I'll pass back to Joan. Okay, so if I can now ask Michelle, if he's going to talk about, well, what does all of this mean in the context then of Northern Ireland? Do you want to continue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so basically, um, so what does all of this mean for Northern Ireland? Well, um, some of the pro we've identified a, a number of problems with Section 75 equality obligations in terms of their interpretation and operationalization. Um, this, this is basically, uh, there's been a lot of research that has already been done in other spheres. Uh, so we're just simply drawing on that range of literature. So the Equality Commission, for example, in 2017 produced a report and Roos 2016 also produced uh, a paper. And what they argued was that despite the existence of Section 75, it's really been common to screen out policy or to use very high level impact assessments in Northern Ireland. And, and indeed that's what our analysis of policy documents indicates that uh, there's a lot of screening out of gender uh, issues. Um, there's little evidence also that significant budget decisions have actually been made or adjusted as a result of identified gender impacts. Um, and, and that's actually quite worrying, despite the fact that there is a body of evidence that indicates there are a number of significant and entrenched gender inequalities in the regions. Uh, there's also additional research, uh, the second point here, there's been a number of reviews that have been conducted around Section 75, how effective they are, and there's also been some economic, and, or sorry, academic analysis uh, that has been conducted in this area, and that's found there's really procedural or thin compliance with equality impact assessments largely undertaken as ex post paper processes. And for those of you who are uh, from the region, you will, of course, know of this research. 
And then more recently, there have been deficiencies in the implementation of Section 75 obligations with the Equality Commission uh, in, for Northern Ireland identifying in 2022, 2020 sorry, the Department of Finance's failure to consult on spending proposals. So there, there's quite a number of problems, it would appear, with respect to Section 75 in terms of its interpretation and how it is operationalized. There's also a significant problem, and we, we've certainly uh, found this in terms of the interviews that we've conducted, uh, particularly at the governmental level, where there is an issue around what is called gender neutrality. And that's been identified also before in other research. So in uh, research that Michelle has carried out, where she's looked at senior civil service, uh, senior civil servant policymakers, uh, she found evidence that equality duties are being treated as symmetrical. So here she has some uh, quotations drawn from her research. If I apply section 75 to the letter, I've just treat everybody exactly the same. Okay, and that's what's actually happening. She also found, uh, if you look at the second quote, we are obsessed with the community background perspective. So for those of you who are not aware of this, we're talking about the Catholic Protestant community background, and that seems to feature. And in actual fact, we found um, some references to that in our interviews, uh, where there, there, was, there was maybe talk of money being allocated based on the community background as opposed to anything else. And that's perhaps worrying. So this person, this second quotation, they're saying they're absolutely obsessed with treating everyone the same and we're paralyzed with fear if we don't actually do that. And I think that came out quite strongly, as I said earlier, in some of our interviews uh, with, um, particularly with uh, civil servants that, you know, everybody has to be treated the same and we can't go down the road of looking at one particular group versus another, irrespective of the fact that, for example, women uh, con 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 constitute, sorry, 50% of the population and the intersectionality issues that I referred to earlier. So it's an, it, it, it's really uh, comes down to this final quote uh, that if, there, if, if a decision is being made around a particular policy, everybody benefits from this. So it's, it's a case of the kind of the boat floating to the top for everyone. So in terms of the... I think Michelle has been able to rejoin now. Michelle, I have talked about uh, both problems with Section 75 I don't know if you want to say any more about that and also the problems of gender neutrality. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. So really just picking up on that in the sense of the, the implications then for policy. I mean, certainly um, it is the case that Section 75 could provide the institutional and legal architecture which would enable gender budgeting. Um, the, the difficulties are around um, interpretation and operation of that duty. But in assessing the favourable conditions, what we are distinctly lacking um, in comparison to, to other um, international examples and, and best practice is the high level political buy-in, um, which would enable and commit the gender budget and processes. Um, and to that effect, what we would recommend is a specific commitment uh, to gender budgeting in the context of the Northern Ireland Executive's Programme for Government. Um, Joan, could we do the next slide? If yeah. So what we've also sort of um, uh, picked up across the, the, the research to date has been the limitations of existing data. So um, when we say limitations, that is both in terms of um, the data that's collected, the data that's subject to analysis and reporting, um, and also that data that is currently collected, um, but not analysed or reported. And we did encounter that quite a bit in the context of this research. So on the basis of um, limitations with data, the operation and implementation of Section 75 um, and the gender neutral default to policy and resource um, allocation, we would recommend that actions taken to develop gender budget and capacity and competence within the Northern Ireland public and civil service. So not a million miles removed from some of the um, express commitments that we've seen in other jurisdictions. Okay, um, Joan, can we? Thanks. So 
have been given an overview, um, well, I hope, of uh, the utility of gender budget and what it is and uh, how we in Northern Ireland are positioned in respect of it. What we'd like to turn to is our case study on apprenticeships policy in Northern Ireland as a very um, practical example of what can be gained from the inculcation of gender analysis in policy formation. Um, and notwithstanding the very stark nature of the gender inequalities that, that we'll come to discuss in the context of the case study, I think it's really critical to point out, and I know Anne-Marie has, has referenced it earlier, but notwithstanding how stark these inequalities are, um, existing inequalities er, analysis in the policy process has been under-responsive to them. It hasn't identified them, and it certainly hasn't actioned them. So when we talk about why there's a distinct need for gender budget analysis, this certainly drives it home. Um, so Joan, could we maybe start the next slide? So um, looking really at the strategic context for apprenticeships in Northern Ireland, we examined Securing Our Success, which is the Northern Ireland strategy on apprenticeships. And that was dated 2014. And uh, the strategy itself comprises 20 policy commitments and an associated implementation plan. But having um, a gender analysis of apprenticeships policy, there were two specific policy commitments that were um, of interest to us. Um, policy commitment 11, which um, talks of including a range of measures which would support the participation of both genders across occupations um, and to address equalities issues. Um, policy commitment 14, um, again of interest to us in the context of economic forecasting and the construction of a skills barometer, which would be established and which is now operational and which hopes to sort of better match um, the apprenticeship supply with demand. Um, could we do the next slide? Thank you, Joe. Okay, so thank you, Michelle. Um, so as Michelle has said, yes, we, we picked apprenticeships because uh, it, it's actually, there, there's quite a lot of data available for the apprenticeships, but let's have a look at, at what we actually found and the data that we used. So just to let you know about the data that we actually used, there's really two sources of data, uh, both of which are published uh, by the Department for the Economy, and they're published in the form of what are called statistical bulletins, and actually make quite interesting reading. You have, first of all, the Apprenticeships NA Statistical Bulletins, and those cover levels two, two stroke three and three, and those are published on a biannual basis, and those are published for quite a significant uh, period of time, you'll see in a moment. We then have the HLA, or the Higher Level Apprenticeship Statistical Bulletins. Those are published for level four and above, and uh, the HLA is only started in September 2017, so we only have two years of data at the moment, so the most recent data is for the year 2018-19. Uh, we're eagerly waiting the data for 2019-20. So we looked at these statistical bulletins trying to ascertain what data was available and as Michelle has already said what data wasn't available but also to understand if there was some data available that hadn't actually been reported upon. So we contacted the department and we did get gender disaggregated data. Now I think it's important to note that although gender disaggregate data has been collected by the Department for the Economy and made available to us. It doesn't actually form part of the data routine published, published sorry, in the statistical bulletins. So what we're saying here is that there actually is more data that can provide significant insights into some of the inequalities that exist around the apprenticeship program in Northern Ireland. And that's good that there is the data available, but it points to the fact that maybe there needs to be a refreshing or whatever of how these statistical bulletins are actually, uh, you know, the focus of them. We also uh, supplemented our analysis with uh, economic analysis commissioned by the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre in relation to productivity and gross added value. And what we're looking at there in those two measures is really what contribution does an apprentice and the apprenticeship programme in total make to the economy? And then based on the results of what we found, then we tried to benchmark back uh, to the policy commitments and the intent as explained in the or outlined in the strategy or apprenticeship on apprenticeships. 
So moving on then to have a look at what does the data actually tell us and I, we've got all of this in, in one of the working papers so you can and look at this later on at your leisure. First of all, this data here, uh, this presents the data for levels two, two stroke three and three since uh, August 2013. And you can see here we have quarterly data. And this is actually taken directly from that, the uh, Apprenticeships NA Statistical Bulletin. And you can see here that men over the entire period of the level two, two stroke three and three have represented the majority of participants on the program. Now, this is a, a much better diagram, I think, because it brings to light more the stark, uh, the, the stark trend that is going on here. So this is that previous data represented in yearly data. And you can see here that what's happening is that men uh, started off with 59% of the total apprentices in 2013 uh, men, and that goes up to 70%. So we're getting a gradual increase here in the percent or the number of the male, male representation, sorry, on the apprenticeship program over time. And more worryingly, that is increasing. And the converse of that, of course, is that women's representation as a whole has been decreasing over time. So going from 41% in the early days right up to 31%. And I think that trend is really worrying. What about the HLAs? Well, we only have the two years data, but we can already see, so the, these are the, the starts, the number of uh, apprentices who start on the HLA program. Remember, the HLA is for levels four and above, okay? And you can see that men, uh, sorry, there, a trend, sorry, is emerging already, showing that more male participants are entering HLA programs compared to females. And that, that quotation there is from the most recent HLA statistical bulletin. So the Department for the Economy has already recognized that a trend is occurring, and actually that's quite, quite a big trend. Now, that, that shows you the trend in, from one year to the next in terms of the number of starts. If you look at the overall numbers on the HLA program, uh, men are uh, is dominated by men at a rate of two to one. So 66% of all HLAs are, represent men and 34% represent women. Right, if we now go on and have a look at the age profile, and the age profile is quite interesting also because it indicates something about women and where women are with respect to these apprenticeships. So what we have down here, we have the proportion of uh, apprenticeship starts by gender. This, by the way, is only for the, uh, the level two, the level two stroke three and the level three. We don't actually have, a, I'm not sure why, but we don't have the same level of data for the HLAs that we do have for uh, the, these lower level apprenticeships. So what we're saying here, that, or the analysis tells us that women are older than men when they start apprenticeships. So if you look here at the 16 to 19 year olds, you'll see that only one in every four of apprenticeships in this age bracket are women. So that indicates that a larger proportion of the spend for women is directed potentially to existing workers, in other words, to the age 24 and above. And these workers are likely to already be in employment and therefore are locked into that employment. So this data suggests that women's career op op options sorry, are being limited from the start of their working lives. Okay, moving on then to look at occupational segregation, and it's probably no surprise that there is occupational segregation. So we didn't find this a surprise. Uh, this is also recognized by the Department for the Economy. Um, but so that what we have here, we have for levels two, two stroke three and three, we have the top, we're only looking at the top here, the, the top uh, areas that comprise about 82% of all apprenticeships. There's, there's some smaller areas, but um, the analysis just, we excluded them there. So what we find is we find really stark occupational segregation. I mean, this is really, really stark here, okay? So if you look at building and construction, there's only 1% of females across the entire program. 
are uh, relate to women. 2% in engineering and 2% in transport operations and maintenance. On the converse, you see that uh, women are mainly uh, in the health and social care sector, and to some, uh, maybe to some extent in the services sector. Uh, there's more equality here in terms of manufacturing and hospitality and catering, but there's huge, huge in, uh, occupational segregation here. And this has made all the worse because these sectors typically comprise the largest numbers of apprenticeships. So it's not just that there's occupational segregation, these sectors comprise the largest number of apprentices. So what about the HLAs, the higher level apprentices? What can we glean from the data that is currently published? So what we have here, we've got the participation of HLEs by subject area uh, and gender, and we're combining 2018 and 19. And we can already see that men are dominating traditional sectors such as engineering. So you can see engineering and manufacturing technology, we have 10% of the apprentices in that area are women. And by the way, that makes up 387 of the higher level apprentices are in this area. That actually is 43% of all HLAs. So what we're saying is that 43% for 43% of all HLAs is male dominated. We can see a similar picture for construction planning and the built environment. And actually, if you combine these two, that gives you 60%. So 60% of all the higher level apprenticeships, there's only approximately 10.5% uh, female representation in those. And then information and communications technology, uh, again, a little bit better, but not much. So if you combine the first three, if you combine the first three uh, blocks here in this graph, that equals 67% of all the HLAs. So what we're saying is that there's significant, I mean, really significant occupational segregation for 67% of all the HLAs. Now, unfortunately, it's not possible to uh, examine other areas. The Department for the Communities have what is called a disclosure control procedure, and we talk about that in the, um, the, uh, the working paper, and that's where small counts are not actually published, and, and you don't actually have the data available to analyze those small counts over time. Therefore, it's not really possible for us to do any sort of differential gender analysis for areas such as tourism, health, public services, and care. Okay, so moving on then to uh, look at the contribution of individual apprentices and apprentice, the apprenticeship program in total to the economy. And this is where we uh, engaged um, with the Economic Policy Centre at Ulster University to provide us with some details. And um, we, use a, we use a measure called GVA. I don't know, you're probably familiar with GVA, gross value added, and it measures basically the contribution to the economy of an individual producer. In our case, that would be an individual apprentice or the industry or sector. So if we looked at the sector as a whole, that would be the contribution which all of the apprentices make to the Northern Ireland economy. And if we look at the individual measure, first of all, the GVA, we can see that men contribute 2.24 times more than women. If we look at the total output, and the total output, remember, that's based, obviously, you take into account the total number of participants the sector and the productivity of the sector. And you can see here that men contribute 5.36 times more to the economy than women. So what this illustrates is that public expenditure disproportionately favors men, and those men are going to reap the benefits over the course of their lifetime. And this also has potentially implications for pension poverty. And this is simply because men study, study subjects linked to higher productivity sectors. So if we then look also at the funding model uh, linked to our apprenticeship policy, so this is the funding model for levels two, two stroke three and three. The funding here differs depending on the level of study. So if you look down here at the left hand side, so there are different 
amounts of funding, or we, I would call that investment. So there's different amounts of investment that are being made depending on if you're level two, a level three, or if you're a young person or an adult. Now remember, a young person, um, there were less females in the young person, if you remember that, less females in that category. Uh, so let's just have a look at this here. So if you look over here at the categories, so what this is showing you is that as you move from category one, for example, to category six, the amount of investment is greater. So just to note that category one, two, three, for example, is allied to subjects like accounting, which is my own area, <coughs> hospitality, financial services, and those areas tend to be dominated by women. While category five and six, uh, relates to subjects such as engineering, construction, etc., and those tend to be dominated by men. So if you look, for example, here at the, the one highlighted in green, for a young person, remember that's up to the age of 24. So a young person in a category two, uh, the investment made in the, that person is 4,400, whereas the investment made in a category seven or six, sorry, uh, apprentice is uh, 7,250 pounds. Sorry, that represents 1.6 times more. Okay, so there, there's more and much more investment made in terms of uh, these subjects over here. Uh, also, if you note here that adults, there's less investment made in adults, uh, which remember are the age 25. And this has a bearing in that there are less females in that earlier, do you remember that earlier age group? There are less females in that earlier age group. So all in all then, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that there's a disproportionate spend on men at the levels two, two stroke three and three. And that's mainly because there's an overrepresentation, first of all, of men on the apprenticeship program. Remember that first, the first two slides that I mentioned. And secondly, there's a clustering of men in the most cost intensive categories. Remember the occupational segregation uh, graphs that we showed you. Now, the thing about this is, look, that this finding is actually entirely consistent with data found elsewhere. So it's not as if there isn't reports, et cetera, elsewhere that will point to the difficulties of this. Uh, now, so we have data from Scotland, which is actually showing similar trends in occupational segregation. And Michelle will talk about that in a wee bit in a moment. Uh, the difference between what we do here and what they do is that they then try and use that data and, and, and try and then bring that into their policy making. Now, just before I continue on here, uh, before I ask Michelle to speak, um, just wanted to mention the HLA funding. Remember, it's only been going for two years, but again, we have a similar picture in terms of the level of funding. So for example, if you take level five funding, the funding ranges from anywhere from 8,400 pounds to 11,400 per apprentice. That's a difference of 36%. And that range depends on the subject being studied. If you look at the level six funding, it ranges from 12,400 to 23,400. That's a whopping difference of 89%. Now it'll come as no surprise to you that this exactly mirrors what's happening in the lower level apprenticeships, that funding at the higher end, I'm talking about the 11,400, for example, in the 23,400, represent traditional areas of study dominated by males. And of course, there are reasons why uh, more funding is allocated to these areas uh, because of the, you know, the sort of equipment, et cetera, that's needed. But nevertheless, uh, this is having an impact in terms of the investment that we're making in women vis-a-vis -vis men. So I'll now ask Michelle to talk about, first of all, the uh, gendered policy practice gap that this or analysis has enabled us to come to the conclusion, and then to talk about recommendations. Okay, thank you, Joan, and I'll try not to drop out of the ether this time. Um, but when we were benchmarking the outcomes against the policy objectives, um, what was really clear to us was that there were a series of uh, dislocations between policy and practice and that they had very gendered consequences. So um, firstly, the strategy does note, and, it, and we, we do note that at Policy Commitment 11, occupational segregation and further notes it as problematic from the outset. Um, and Joan has mentioned it um, just there that 
the distinction really between uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland is that there are no targets or performance indicators which accompany this particular policy commitment, which has the effect of really rendering it rhetorical and, and aspirational. Um, there's no reporting requirement, hence it doesn't really appear again in the context of the statistical bulletins or the analysis. Um, in Scotland, there's a specific target which uh, sets to reduce to 60% the percentage of modern apprenticeship frameworks where the gender balance is 75, 25 or greater. And um, significantly, this is um, not a freestanding commitment, but rather it's reinforced through a series of complementary actions which feed into that target. Um, which are located in other policy areas such as education and childcare. Um, Joan, could we maybe do the next slide? Thank you. So the second dislocation between um, policy and practice that we um, established in the context of our analysis was located in the stark differential which exists within that 60, 16 to 19 year old participant age group. Um, so the policy really, the apprenticeships policy is not actually encountering women at the start of their career paths, but rather when they're on established trajectories. Um, and, and that's really quite significant because that's locking in occupational segregation. Um, and also um, as a policy intervention, which is designed to catch needs, that is uh, people who are not in education or training, um, whilst it has certainly the, um, has, has done that for young men, it is not uh, meeting that policy requirement in terms of young women. And then it's not functioning in a way that uh, engages young women as needs. Uh, Joan, could we just maybe move on then to, yeah, thank you. So um, the final dislocation between gender policy and, and practice was in, located in the capacity of the strategy to identify and be responsive to skills demand in Northern Ireland. And at the outset, we talked about policy commitment 14, which was to establish a skills barometer to match supply and demand. And that's really based um, in and around economic forecasting of the, the key skills required for growth. Um, and in, in assessing this, um, we came to the conclusion that using economic forecasting based solely on GVA and productivity me measures meant that the barometer has the potential to influence those skills assessments in ways which privilege occupations allied to manufacturing and production, where product can be seen and counted. Um, and as a direct consequence of that, really, it, it really doesn't conceptualize the economic value that exists beyond those productivity measures. Um, and I think when we talk about occupational segregation, Whilst it's certainly important to open non-traditional sectors to women, it's equally important to recognise and value the work that women do as skilled work. Um, and that work um, as it relates to social care and the economic value and the economic contribution of social care is an area that really um, the existing forecasting tools and skills barometer is totally under responsive to that. Um, and that has huge implications for um, the value that's accorded to that work and the ability of economic forecasting to identify the skills to support that sector. This is particularly um, pressing at the moment because as a result of the, the COVID pandemic, I think we're all acutely aware of the value and the economic value of social care. So um, I think what's really significant is that the existing um, forecasting tools are not really recognizing that um, economic value of social care. Joan, can we, um, so on the basis of our um, analysis of the, the data and the policy practice disconnect, we have a series of policy recommendations. And amongst those, we would recommend the development of short and long-term smart targets with associated performance indicators, which would move to reduce occupational um, segregation. Um, and we, we've talked about that in the context of similar commitments in Scotland, which um, in very real ways have complementary policy levers. There, when we looked at international best practice on apprenticeships and what really works in terms of making these much more gender equal, there was significant evidence um, in favour of the utility of women-only training programmes in those non-traditional sectors such as construction and engineering. We would further recommend um, that the existing uh, incentives for employers could be reassessed with a view to usefully incorporating a gender premium where employers and sectors and individuals could benefit 
um, additionally by um, meeting some of those gender targets. Interestingly, um, in an analysis for um, the apprenticeships, review of apprenticeships in England and Wales, um, public procurement was identified as a process which could be used as a policy lever to ensure greater gender equality and diversity. And we felt that that would have a lot of utility in this context in harnessing public expenditure for gender equality. And we thought that might look like um, consideration of apprenticeship quotas for women in non-traditional sectors as elements of public contracts. And the final recommendation that we make in the working paper is the rebalancing of the higher level apprenticeship framework to, or to acknowledge sorry, the economic contribution of care-based professions to the Northern Ireland economy. I'm just going to pass back to Joan, who's going to talk about next steps in terms of the research and uh, forward planning. Okay, so thank you, Michelle. Just to uh, highlight also that we are going to be doing some work around uh, care-based professions and social care as part of our Joseph Rowntree uh, project. So that really finishes our uh, formal presentation uh, with respect to what we're finding so far, as Amory has already indicated, there will be other webinars coming up uh, because we just simply could not, in ref on reflection, we simply could not present the vast body of research that we have collated. And I mean, it's absolutely huge. Uh, so we thought it was better to put it into bite-sized chunks and, uh, you know, to deliver it like that there. Um, so kind of watch this space for further events. Uh, just to let you know, we're currently engaged in a second phase and we're really delighted that Joseph Rowntree uh, have seen the value in what we're doing and the potential for it to have, to have significant impact and they're once again funding us. What we're looking at now, we're looking at building competency and capacity for gender budgeting in Northern Ireland and that involves really two things. First of all, to map the current budgetary processes within uh, our current process. Actually, the budget is very difficult. I'm an accountant and it actually is quite difficult to understand the process and uh, Katrina's nodding her head there. It's really quite difficult even for somebody who is professionally qualified. Uh, so we think there is a need to improve, look at the mapping of the process and where are the entry points that one could um, do a gender analysis but also to improve stakeholders, key stakeholders understanding of that there. So I would include civil, civil society, uh, etc. And also then to deliver a program where we're converting the findings from our, our first phase and this phase into practical tools and training materials to improve capacity of civil society organizations and uh, those who are scrutinizing budgetary decisions and to improve gender analysis. And, and really, uh, this is an ongoing project. It, it, it's it just, the more you get into it, the more you find that is useful and, you know, ways of uh, enlightening people about gender budgeting and how it might work in Northern Ireland. And we hope that uh, you will be part of our journey in this really exciting uh, project that we're undertaking. So, Anne-Marie, I'll just hand back to you if that's okay. Thanks very much, Joan. So just to remind you that in a moment or two, you're going to have the opportunity of some of your questions answered so there's been a couple so far so if you could put your questions into the chat box please so just uh, the final part of the formal presentations is to hand over to lynn carvel now lynn is chair of the northern ireland women's budget group and lynn's just going to provide some brief reflections on the implications for their work of what she's heard today thanks and um, thanks very much Anne Marie, and thank you uh, to the research team um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's difficult, I think, to tell over Zoom um, because of body language and we're Zoomed out and everything else. But I want people to know how um, super excited I am this morning to be here um, on behalf of the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group and to be listening to um, you, um, the research team, talk about, about the work that has happened. Um, it's, it's, it's just great to be at this stage and, and I think very, very timely. Um, 
to have it laid out in black and white, things that we already knew, like we, we've been talking about apprenticeships, we've been talking about government spend and the inequalities um, mm -hmm. that we know exist, but it's, but it's not there. And now it's laid out in, in black and white. So I, do, I want to, first of all, pay tribute to the research team, because I know you've been incredibly bu um, busy pulling all of this together. And then there's the timeliness of this, because we are now in, in a time where we are being consulted and responding to consultations on the Northern Ireland budget and programme for government. So I think it's, it's, it's very, very timely indeed. Mm -hmm. So the Women's Budget Group has been in existence now 10 years. Um, 2011, we started, um, and as a response really to, at the time, it was the Cameron, it was the Coalition Emergency Budget, um, and which was a budget of huge austerity and cuts to welfare. And like a lot of people are still working on this issue, but the cuts to welfare meant it was cuts to women's income. And the, the Women's Budget Group was established um, as a response to that. And over the years, we've been working voluntarily and um, we have been fostered by our, our friends in Scotland, Angelo Hagen, by the Scottish Women's Budget Group, um, and attended and spoke at various conferences. Um, and more recently, have been working on a four nations ba basis um, with our colleagues in Scotland, Wales and um, England. And I think what, what has happened, what, what, you, when you, what you've spoken about this morning is, you know, it, it shows clearly that Northern Ireland has a long way to go to catch up with, with even where Scotland, um, Wales um, and the south of Ireland actually are in terms of, of all of this. So our group is in a new phase of development um, with this excellent partnership with Ulster University. And we've recently recruited um, our first coordinator, coordinator Alex Brennan, who, who is um, in the audience with us this morning. I think having this resource provides the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group with the foundation and evidence to advocate for much needed change across a range of policy areas. And it's just something that we haven't really had access to before. Um, as already has been mentioned, the outworkings of government spend is far from gender neutral and the use of gender budgeting tools will expose this and that, that has been um, well exposed this morning. As someone I think has said over, we've been meeting quite frequently recently, you know, if you, you um, with the robust evidence base make the snowballs, I think that the, um, the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group can, are very happy to throw them. And that's, it's, that's the synergy of our, of our work. Um, you could spend days in this, but COVID has illuminated deep inequalities in our society. And we know the importance of care now. We always have, but it's, it's been absolutely in our face. We know the importance of care. And this morning, we know now how little is invested in this area, an area um, predominated by female workers and an area where much of it is actually unpaid. So this absolutely needs to be um, explored further. The work on apprenticeships is mind blowing. Um, we have known that there are gender inequalities, but the extent is um, incredulous, um, even to me um, and, my, and my day job. So public expenditure is actually exacerbating and consolidating labour market segregation and actually exacerbating and consolidating um, women's lifetime um, and reducing women's lifetime earnings capacity. This cannot be allowed to continue. It always strikes me how, um, and I think this was um, famous feminist economist Marilyn Waring, but um, if we don't count it, it doesn't count. And that is absolutely true. And it it's also strikes me, and sometimes I wish I knew less, but if we, we can't unknow what we know, and I think that's what this, is, this morning is about. Like now we know it's been exposed, now we know about apprenticeships, now we know girls don't access it, now we know there's much less invested in them. So we can't, we can't unknow that. Um, and thanks to this research, it is imperative that we address the gender spend um, on apprenticeships. If girls and boys, women and men are to have fair labour market opportunities and experiences. So this must happen if lifelong labour market disadvantage for women and girls is to be challenged. So on behalf of the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group, we are delighted to be working with Ulster University in this project and we are looking forward to future research and collaboration. I absolutely believe, and I probably are not going to articulate this well enough, but I absolutely believe that the synergy between the academic team at UU and civil society organisations and activists who are um, the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group um, are a fantastic catalyst for change. The sum of the whole will be, may, will be way more than the sum of the parts. And um, so we're very much looking forward to continue um, working with the team. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lynn. So I'm going to move right away to questions just to give people time. So again, to encourage you just to put your questions in the chat box. So we've got a couple of questions at the moment. Um, one from Roseanne around the linkage between um, 
the uh, inequalities that have been highlighted in terms of spend and how that plays out in wages. Um, Joan and Michelle, so if you want to say something about that, first of all. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we do have some information on wages. However, um, Roseanne, the way that the data is reported, it, it's a minefield trying to reconcile when you know we have information on wages, but trying to reconcile it to the categories of work, you know, to the categories of work outlined in the statistical bulletins, it's it's almost impossible. But just to give you an idea, um, if we take say construction, so uh, construction, the, their work, their wage relative to the Northern Ireland average is about plus ten percent. Uh, Information and communications technology. Do you remember that was one of the ones where the male dominated 30 plus 38 percent, manufacturing plus 14 percent. If you look at barbering, beauty therapy, childcare, hairdressing, nail services, blah blah, uh, minus 31 percent. Um, so there, there, there is some data, but it, to be honest, Rosanna, it's really difficult to reconcile it, and for it to be for us to make exact recommendations and can bring conclusions about that. I hope that makes sense. Thanks, uh, Joan. Um, Greti has uh, really asked a, a question and a comment, which is that whether or not uh, our team would be making um, a response to the budget um, consultation. And if so, if we could make that available so that others can also advocate for greater transparency in the budgetary process. So just to say that we're all cutting it a bit fine. The consultation responses are due in today. We have ours just about completed. And I think we can certainly do that. We could put it on the project part of the um, ARC website. And maybe perhaps Lynn, I know the Women's Budget Group has also done a response. Perhaps we could also on that uh, site provide a link to yours um, or, or yep. a copy if that's okay. Absolutely. We'll try and do that. Could I, could I just sorry um, jump in on that. Um, whilst we do have a response, um, just want to put a bit of a health warning on it. Um, the Women's Budget Group response is thematic. They, they have looked mm. at the issues in terms of policy and uh, the gender implications of that. The research team response to the draft budget has focused you know we didn't want to duplicate so we've looked really more macro at the, the issues of process mm -hmm. as opposed to content so um they're they're complementary you should probably look at them together, together because they take a different uh, approach yeah okay thanks uh, lynn and uh michelle so maybe we could coordinate that then just later today and make make those available to people then um the question um around uh from emma sheeran around uh the accountability um, and how that would work in apartments where there may be some political objection. I think one of the things we found maybe in our research was maybe not so much an objection, but um, issues of understanding maybe mm -hmm. and application. Michelle, Joan, Lynn, and Angela, because I, I know Angela, you're further down the road with this as well, so it might be quite interesting to hear how you overcome some of these issues. I think maybe if I could just bring that back to the need for a high level political commitment towards gender budgeting, because I think um, certainly in the course of, of my own research and, and research with the project, I don't think, you know, at the level of, of equalities analysis, I've encountered ideological objection, but I think the difficulty is where there is a degree of um, the absence of a sort of overarching political agreement. It's very difficult to move in the absence of that. So I think that where you have that, then um, you know you have processes and you, and you have um, accountability. So I think the combination of inculcating capacity, competence, and the high-level commitment, um, you know, goes towards those those processes being effective. Would uh, would maybe Katrina? I don't know, Katrina. Are we putting you in the spot if we asked you about this? I mean, I th you know, I think I mean it's a difficult area here. You know. Do we start kind of making some progress in terms of gender budgeting in terms of maybe some case studies maybe 
it'd be good to work with the department for the economy on the apprenticeships, for example, and there may be other opportunities to work with other departments on case studies so we can start to see maybe the benefits of gender budgeting. But what are we putting you in the spot to ask do you about that issue? Uh, no, not at all, Joan. And and I think actually Michelle's point is is right. The the starting point seems to me to be the buy-in and the absolute clear commitment, and therefore the clear direction. Um, but that's not a one-way street because for ministers to give that, they need good advice from their civil servants as well. And and I think looking at the apprenticeship case study brings me back to the fundamental difference between knowing stuff and doing something about stuff. So, you know, you've pointed up very clearly, there's lots of information. Some of it is easily available, but not published. That's interesting. It's made me ask some questions about some of the information I know we have, but maybe we don't put um, in, you know, in our publications. But there, there is something around, you know, just, just having data is never enough. You've got to have curiosity and you've got to think about what is this actually telling me and what does it mean for me and what I might do about it. And that does take me back to, I think, what we were talking about earlier, which is you know, this is essentially something that has to be hardwired into the very start of the policy process. What am I trying to achieve? So in apprenticeships, if you take that example, what am I trying to achieve? Is it just better skilled people in certain areas where we know there are shortages or is it something more sophisticated than that? And that's right back to policy objective because if you're going to evaluate your policy, you'll only ever evaluate it against the objectives that you set for it. Can I, can I come in there? It just, it just it reminds me of something as well. And I know it's, it's, it's you know, we're coming from, probably um, the, the more activist part of this, but I used to have a, um, a um, postcard behind me and it was, it was a picture and it was pay your, pay your uh, daughter less pocket money than your son. Do you remember that one? And it just, it strikes me as that. So, and I understand the need to understand this, first of all, which, we're, which we really have uh, moved, moved on this this morning, but there is an imperative and there is an accountability that we, we cannot be um, setting up our daughters for to be paid less and to be in precarious work and to be and um, to have poor pension provision and to be precarious financially and um, throughout their lives so you know that's where that's where it actually sits so there's a push from that end that politically we can't allow this to happen and it's that thing as Katrina is a sad thing where now we can't we can't know what we know now so so it's it's the how we make it happen and I I also and I believe on, on the back of what you said, a lot of people just don't know, you know, and I, I don't understand. But now that when you have the information, uh, it's what what we're going to do with it, and it's the how how we're going to make to make this happen. But the imperative is now clearly is clearly there. Yeah, Angela, do you have anything you'd want to, to add? You know, in terms of um, the d departments you know, appreciating the need to do gender budgeting or officials and, and how that can, you know, be progressed. I'm not sure there's much to add to, to what colleagues have said. I think the political commitment at senior level um, that drives the sustained commitment from directorate level within civil servants and to address that operational gap. And one of the ways that we see an operational gap is in um, really variable, and I'm being diplomatic, really variable quality of equality impact assessments, understanding what an equality impact assessment is. And I think there's a lot of confusion and I would actually say equality impact assessment is a bit of a misnomer because it's about trying to understand in the first instance what the current situation is and then, and how we've got to that situation. And so therefore what policy levers and what interventions would be appropriate. But to really get into that, there needs to firstly be an appreciation and an acceptance that this is a legitimate activity. And that's the other thing that we need to nail as well is some of the chat sometimes about trade-offs. Oh, well, we've got other priorities, we've got other things to do. Well, if the priority is economic development and economic stability, if the priority is a, a gender equal economic recovery, then you have no excuse not to take on board the data that, that we've heard about today, not to take on board the kind of transformational approaches to policy making that will deliver the kinds of outcomes that themselves are, are transformative. Um, and 
that's not a trade-off. And because the trade-off manifests with, well, there are so many demands. We've got equality impact assessments, we've got human rights impact assessments, we've got 70, section 75, we've got environmental impact assessments. They're all going in the same direction, or they should be going in the same direction. And, and I think that culture of, of trading off those priorities um, also has to be addressed if those commitments are to be operationalised. Thanks, Angela. Um, I don't know if the panellists can see the uh, two quite lengthy questions from Noel there in the chat box, but maybe um, to take the first one, um, which was that you could have 50, theoretically have 50 50 spend, but still occupational segregation, and how you guard against that. Give a minute or two. Well, I think that that that's, that is a difficult issue. Um, I think, in the absence of having no measures or perform performance measures, we don't really know where we're going at the moment. It seems to be that we're just letting it kind of continue on the way it is. Uh, so I agree, Noel, that we could get into a position like that, but I think we need to try and do something about it first of all. Um, I mean, it's well recognised in Northern Ireland. We had a huge push in STEM, uh, and I think the person responsible for STEM, I remember Lorna, her name was, I forgot her second name. She seemed to just disappear. I don't know what happened, where she went, and she was doing a tremendous job. I don't know who, who's actively pushing, for example, STEM. We need to get back out to the schools, etc. I, I think that we can't get to a position where we have occupational segregation at such a stark level and say, well, it's okay, let's just keep going on like that. We need to actually do something about it and actually try and make some progress. And it's only by trying and evaluating whether or not you're getting there. We can then think about, you know, new initiatives, etc. So, I, I mean, I, I don't have a full answer for you, Noel, but I think we need to at least address it and not let it continue because it's been continuing for years and that I don't think that's good enough. Um, just to come in off the back of Joan's point there and I think there's a danger Noel in just sort of reducing gender budgeting to the spend mm. um, and thinking you know that if you have a, an equal spend then it will you know and that won't impact occupational segregation of course it won't. Um, I think when we're talking about gender budget and you need to factor in all the other um, financial elements of that, which is, um, and the point that Joan made about pension poverty, the differential salaries over people's life course, um, you know, those will be unequal as a result of occupational segregation. So even with a, an equal spend, the, the, the overall finance, financial picture will never really be equal in the, the context of occupational segregation. Um, and I think Katrina made the point earlier in the uh, presentation, I think it's valid, that gender budget is about much more than, than spend and budget reallocations. It's about um, policy decisions and the analysis that underpins that. So um, I do think that in terms of occupational segregation, you know, it's a, it's a long term project of work. But unless we start to sort of deconstruct it and have actions against it that have performance indicators, um, and part of that is not only sort of looking to introduce women to non-traditional sectors, but it's Roseanne's point about the, the economic value of social care. It's recognizing the work that women do and its economic contribution is an equally valid part of um, addressing occupational segregation. Thanks, Michelle. Um, just wanted to respond to Tim's um, point about uh, Section 75 uh, and the sort of we're missing the intersectionality and particularly um, around the, um, the, the how migrant women may be more likely to be in low, low uh, paid occupations and so on. And just to say, Tim, that you know, certainly from my experience on working recently with the um, uh, panel looking at the evidence base for the new gender equality strategy, there's yet another one of these data gaps that we have. We, you know, we know that that is from, certainly from data in other parts of the UK, that that is very, very likely. Um, and we know we need to do that analysis um, and so that we can identify the impact of that intersectionality. Um, and I think, um, you know, I'm really happy that that is one thing that is being flagged up, you know, as we move towards developing the new gender equality strategy is that it really hinges on having really good high quality data and, and that data being published for scrutiny purposes as well. 
Um, was there another question here? So uh, Angela's put in a response um, uh, to that. Um, just before we end, maybe Angela, I had a question just for uh, you on something you had said about the role of independent fiscal office. And I thought given that uh, fiscal offices, <laughs> um, given that we are uh, going to have, I understand, a fiscal council in Northern Ireland, um, what might the role of that council be in terms of progressing uh, gender, gender budgeting? And what do what, what, was, what do we need to you know what do we need to do what does that council need to look like you know in order to help us in that respect? Well, no, nothing like a, a wee quickie, a wee quick question <laughs> <laughs> to end on. Um, I think I mean the, the independence of it is important, um, and that it, it has a a role and is resourced to in terms of the skill set that's brought into the council um, to do the kinds of analysis that this research team have been doing um, across policy and to understand I think as well that there is an acceptance you know, kind of challenging the orthodoxy of public finance um, that public finance and equalities are two separate worlds they have to they have to collide they have to overlap through something like an independent fiscal council um, that actually takes a perspective on public spending and public revenue as being about people and being about lived experience and and the lived effects of finance and policy decisions and that means that it is within the the remit to do that um, you know of a council like that to have a look at the the, the effects the um, US Congress Office of Budget Responsibility, for example, looks at the budgets in terms of how much budget proposals are going to cost, but they also do separately from that. Um, and I wouldn't say that, that the Fiscal Council should only look at a kind of cost benefit analysis approach. I don't think that's helpful. Um, but to look at the, the OBR, um, uh, sorry, Council Bud uh, Congress Budget Office looks at um, some of the you know the, the demographic impacts of of different policy consequences and and if that's i'm not familiar with the pro, the proposals for the the fiscal council but if that's the kind of organism that's being proposed which would be quite different from the scottish fiscal commission for example um so if it's more like the scottish fiscal commission there's a longer road to go to get it to think about um equality stuff but it's more like the congress budget office there's more of a chance to to bring in that that analysis Thanks, Angela. Now we're really pretty much at our time, but there's maybe time for this one last question, uh, which you can see on the chat there from Jarlath Kearney around the, the macro level, the need for political commitment uh, um, as established yet our quasi constitutional settlement, um, given that's a discursive narrative within which policy works doesn't really address it as argued social policy and equality through a gender lens. And then whether the way to address that would be for a new Ireland-UK political agreement, recalibrating uh, the devolved narrative through a gender. Just an easy one to finish with. Um, or is that something for, a, for the next seminar? Just to say, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> yeah. can i come in can i come in on that and say like one of one of the you know when we're working it's it's interesting when we're working across the four nations it becomes quickly clear how difficult it is for us to move things forward and progress things you know and it's it's a good thing to to be aware of because there is a government in scotland there is a government in wales that is one party and we're dealing with um five um, and so it is difficult and there has to be a way you know it's not we're sometimes we don't do too badly but it's good to know that we're working in um different circumstances and i think um angela when you come over as part of the commission in november and met with um the the um women's sector representatives and and all the commissioners met i mean everybody was quite blown away with the circumstances that we were working within it is very very hard but we are working within it and um you know I, I just i'm going to start i'm going to go back to that beginning again it's like in the end of the day it's i've got two daughters it's my daughters i have to think about as 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 they go through life it's worth it's worth fighting for so you know it's 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 young people and it's young women and that's that's where we where, where we take our argument and um, yes we're, we're a hardier bunch over here 
because um, I think we have to be, but, but it's possible. Uh, the, the, the bigger overarching political thing there, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to have that conversation separately. <laughs> okay, well, um, I know it's important these things really finish in time because people have so many Zoom meetings to go to. So I just want to really thank everyone, to thank you for registering and attending today. Um, you will get an email with details of where to access um, the working papers and it was in the chat box earlier as well. To thank our presenters very much and to thank Katrina for uh, agreeing to come to our sem seminar for opening and for staying for the whole time as well. And of course, you know, I think we have to remember that gender budgeting is really important for women's and men's equality. It's really important for our economy, but it's really important to us in Northern Ireland as well um, so that we can have a sustainable peace because the international research on that is overwhelming that for our peace process to be successful uh, and, and durable, we need to address these really embedded inequalities. So thank you all very much. <laughs>